this week on the Back Table Podcast. I think radi- interventional radiologist has a surgical mindset in many ways about how to deal with problems. I mean, when I think about stopping bleeding, like when somebody comes in bleeding, I think about, I- is it a surgical problem where I need to operate on? Is it a problem where my friends in interventional radiology can help me? And what we try to do is we try to figure out, well, what is a combined approach? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Back Table Podcast your source for conversations in health equity. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians, clinically proven radiation protection during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the Back Table podcast. Now, back to the episode. My name is Vishal Kumar, and I will be your host this week. Today, I am truly humbled to be joining in conversation with Dr. Andre Campbell, who is nothing short of a living legend. Dr. Campbell is a master surgeon, teacher, mentor, clinical researcher, clinical educator, and all-around amazing human being. Two of Dr. Andre Campbell's roles in the community here in San Francisco are as an attending trauma surgeon at San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center, and as a full professor of surgery at the University of California San Francisco School of Medicine, where he has been on faculty for over two decades. Dr. Campbell attended Harvard University, where he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in biology. Afterwards, he attended medical school at UCSF, followed by his formal medical and surgical training at Columbia University Medical Center in New York City. Dr. Campbell is one of the most decorated surgical educators, having received numerous awards both locally and nationally. Throughout the pandemic, Dr. Campbell also served as a pillar of strength in the community providing expert guidance and leadership to countless interviews with news outlets within the media. He is a staunch advocate for gun control and continues to fight in order to protect members of our community. His Twitter handle is at TraumaDocSF, and I believe he is currently close to over 10,000 followers. I'm not sure how many people are listening to this podcast, but maybe we can get him closer to 100,000. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, Michelle, thank you for that outstanding introduction. I really appreciate it. It's very humbling to hear those great words. I really appreciate, you know, you having me on the podcast today. I'm I am not an expert in podcasts, but I'm trying to learn. And, uh, you know, we hope to get a chance to have a great time chatting today. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And I am no expert in podcasts either. I got to thank the incredible team at the back table here for making us sound like podcast experts. Now, before we begin, would you be willing to share something about your personal story, maybe before your professional identity as a physician and trauma surgeon was was molded? Well, first of all, just to kind of give you a little background from who who I am, uh, I'm originally from New York City, um, so I was raised and born and raised in Queens, New York. Um, I attended grade school in uh, the Jamaica part of Queens, which is in the southeast part of Queens. Uh, My family is a story of an immigrant family. Uh, I am Jamaican. I was born in New York, but both sides of my family, both mother and father, are both uh, Jamaican. So we have an immigrant story in our family. I saw many of my family members come from Jamaica, have to go through getting green cards and becoming citizens in the United States. My mom was a naturalized citizen. My dad uh, was born in in New York, but his parents were naturalized U.S. citizens. So I know the immigrant story well. Nobody in my family um, really had a formal education to speak of in my immediate family, my grandparents or my parents. Neither one of my parents actually finished high school. Uh, My mom didn't go to high school. My dad did not finish high school. He was a custodian or a environmental services worker in a building in Manhattan. And my mom uh, worked as a foster mother at home and also ran a what was probably a community daycare center uh, when I was growing up. So that kind of gets you a little bit of background of where I'm from. I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood. Say uh, I was going through changes 
in that there was a fair amount of what we can look at as white flight out of my neighborhood. So when I first started in school, um, it was fairly balanced. And then by the time I finished the eighth grade, uh, it had been, the neighborhood was totally different. And I used to see moving vans every day, leaving Rochdale Village, which is a it's a cooperative project, cooperative actually, uh, in development about a half mile from where I grew up. And I would see people moving out because uh, they were going to the suburbs and they were mainly my white classmates and their families moving out uh, of the area. Uh, so that kind of gives you a bit of an idea where I grew up in. I decided to, I was interested in science and possibly being a doctor, so I applied to the specialized high schools in New York City, which are at the time were Stuyvesant. It was Bronx Science and Brooklyn Tech, and I ended up getting into Stuyvesant High School, and which is a math and science high school. And by then, I had pretty much decided I was going to be a physician, although I was not sure what kind of physician, but I knew that I wanted to get the best background possible, and that's why I went to uh, that high school. So that kind of gives you an idea. So what it meant is that every day, I would go on two trains and a bus, traveling an hour and 20 minutes at least, maybe more, back and forth to school. And it was... Interesting, challenging. Uh, it was really a great institution. I was involved with sports, academics, the clubs in the school, and had a lot of great friends, you know, who were at, at my high school, some of which I've seen as I go back for different uh, reunions. So it's a, it was a pretty exciting time in my life to be able to go from where I grew up in Queens to Manhattan. So I had friends all over New York, and it really changed my view of New York City because I had friends in the Bronx, friends in Manhattan, friends in Queens, friends in Brooklyn. So I really got a chance to see all of New York and its glory as I was growing up. I want to thank you for sharing your your background, your story, and your identity uh, with us. As someone who was not born in the United States, I feel a commonality uh, with you, with the story of immigrants and resilience and perseverance in the setting of adversity. There is a lot to unpack uh, with many of the elements that you spoke of, and I hope we can come back to that throughout our discussion. One thing you mentioned was that kind of despite all odds, you had an inspiration or a drive towards science and medicine. Would you be able to speak to the role of mentorship or sponsorship in your journey, or do you feel like it was something you had to achieve by yourself? Well, I'll just say this, that I don't think anybody is successful on their own. And I did not have people in my family who can mentor me or help me. What I did over years, I sought out people uh, who I thought could help me. And I got involved in different organizations that allowed me to get exposure to the field that I wanted to pursue. So what does that mean? When I was in high school, I was fortunate to be involved in this program called the Pre-Medical Research and Educational Program, which took inner city high school students and exposed them to medicine, made them think about careers in medicine. And we got a chance to take classes on the weekends. Uh, in college, there was support for getting jobs as well as in high school. It was a summer program I was involved in, and what happened was a group of people uh, that I met in that program basically became, a bunch of us all became doctors, and we all became support system for each other. So uh, when we had the hard times, we helped each other out, whether it's college, medical school, and training. Uh, we went to each other's weddings. Uh, we did lose some of our members along the way, and we attended some funerals, unfortunately. But we were able to support each other as we went through. So this allowed us to get support. And as a part of this program, too, I met more senior physicians who were surgeons, who were medicine doctors, who were pediatricians, who basically helped us and supported us along the way. Because I don't think anybody could be successful with mentorship, no matter if you're in high school, college, or in medicine, or even a professor at University of California, San Francisco. Mentorship counts. Mentorship is important. Supporting people uh, as they come up is is a central part of what we do as physicians. And I, I can't overemphasize the importance of mentorship as you move along and you move up in the world of academia or in whatever field that you choose. You must have mentorship. You must have support. And people have to be looking out for you to help you to be successful. I appreciate your response and want to express my gratitude for your words about mentorship and support, I think. For many early career, mid-career 
aspiring healthcare providers to be. These are incredible words of advice to look to others to help support you. And remember, your mentors don't always have to look like you. There can still be those who are willing to to lift you and sponsor you. If I may ask, what maybe series or events or what perhaps were you feeling in your life experience that inspired you towards medicine? You kind of inclined that this was something you felt at an early age. That's a great question. I have to say that when I was young, I thought I wanted to be an astronomer. I kind of fell in love with the planets and science. And and then I basically had a series of teachers who were so inspirational. I had a sixth grade science teacher. His name was uh, Claude McMorris. Uh, And uh, Mr. McMorris was so excited about science and learning. It just kind of got me excited about, wow, this thing is really cool, this science stuff. And then I was actually pretty good in science. I was pretty good in mathematics. And I said, well, if I'm going to try to dedicate my life to doing something that would be positive, something would be interesting, something would be challenging, I said, well, maybe I could I could look at medicine. Now, I didn't have a lot of people to talk to about it, but I said, well, maybe I could try to pursue that uh, as something interesting because it combined science with dealing with people. And I thought that would be something for me that would be interesting for me to do as I went through uh, the process. So science I loved because of the I had great role models when I was younger. And then I ended up thinking about medicine more as I got closer to the reality of what it was going to be. Uh, so that's really what you, what you need. The first thing is to really have the fire of the excitement the enthusiasm for something. And then you just pursue it as you, as you keep working towards your goal. Thank you so much for sharing that journey with us. And if I'm not mistaken, you have training, uh, if not board certification in both medicine and surgery. How did you gravitate towards trauma care and trauma medicine? As a medical student, I was a bit uncertain what I wanted to be when I grew up. And uh, that's something that I think many of your listeners may identify with, because in medical school, I was excited by pediatrics because my mom was a foster mother, and I loved the kids, but the parents kind of drove me nuts, so I said, well, I can't do peds. Uh, I thought about OBGYN, and I, at that time, men really dominated OBGYN, but I thought that I wanted to be in a field where it would not make a difference whether or not it was a, I was a man or a woman, and so I kind of said, well, maybe not OB, and then I ended up looking at medicine and surgery. You know, I like the people I work with in medicine. I like the things that we talked about and things, the problems that we had. But surgery was something that always kind of excited me a lot too. So I went medicine, surgery, medicine, surgery. I said, well, let me do something a little crazy because I was uncertain. And I ended up applying in both medicine and surgery, which I thought was something because I was a little bit lost. I thought I was making decisions a little bit early for me. But I thought I would just go ahead and do it. And then at the last minute, uh, I had some influence from a mentor in medical school who said, well, if you're not really sure, do medicine because medicine is the path of least resistance. So I decided that I would be a medicine doctor. So one year turned into two years, turned into three years, and I still had the surgery bug. And so what I did is I went back through the match again. I applied in surgery and I matched in surgery at Columbia. So I went to I went to Columbia to do my internal medicine training back in New York because when I was in medical school, my, my father passed away, decided I would be closer to my family in New York, and I, I had gone to UCSF for medical school, so I decided to go back. So uh, over the years, I basically uh, was doing medicine. I took care of sick people. I was used to that. I switched into surgery. I continued to do that, and at the time, we were in the midst of the crack pandemic or crack epidemic in New York, and so I got used to taking care of people who were violently injured, people who were shot, people were stabbed, people thrown out of buildings. So I gravitated then to ICU care and trauma care, and that's how I ended up being a trauma surgeon uh, from doing that. I, at one point, was board certified in internal medicine, and um, I was also certified in surgery and surgical critical care. Right now, I have active certifications in surgery and surgical critical care. I was the fourth person in the United States to be triple boarded in internal medicine, general surgery, and surgical critical care. I was looking around for a job, and, and what happened was I was able to get a job after um, a lot of things at San Francisco General Hospital. Looked around all over the country, looked at academic jobs and other types of jobs, and I decided I would come here because I met um, Haile DeBass along the way, and he suggested that I apply for a job here, and I ended up, before he was dean, he was chair of surgery, and he ended up recruiting me to UCSF based on 
some experiences that we had prior to me getting here. That's such an incredible story. Uh, again, resonating with mentorship and the pressures that I think students feel about getting to medical school and then having to immediately make a decision about what they are going to do for the rest of their life. Um, I think patience and being true to yourself really resonate with me in your in your story about it's okay to not know the right answer at, during this time and self exploration is critical to finding what you're passionate about, even if it takes a little bit longer. Trauma medicine is unlike any other specialty, I feel like, in medicine. And somebody who's not biased, being an interventional radiologist who works at a level one trauma center and gets to try to help deliver what I think is incredible care, what perspective would you like to share with our audience as a trauma surgeon who probably sees things that you only dream of or nightmares of or see attempted to mimic in Hollywood or media? Well, I think that when people think about trauma surgery, they don't really think about trauma surgeons, right? They think about, oh, you're an emergency medicine doctor, and there's a lot of confusion with that. And I tell people, I said, okay, well, I am a general surgeon, but I'm really a trauma surgeon. So it means I take care of people at a time of their life when they've had been injured, they've been hurt, and uh, they need to have help. And I've been fortunate to be at a great place here at San Francisco General to provide excellent, outstanding care. We have great pre-hospital care, great ED physicians, great trauma surgeons, anesthesiologists, interventional radiologists, therapists of all kinds. Uh, we have first-class uh, radiologists who work with us, so we're quite Fortunate, we have folks like you working in interventional radiology, which really makes our life so much easier as we take care of patients. So we have a chance to intervene in a positive way in people's lives. I always thought when uh, before I became a doctor, as I became a doctor, I wanted to be the one who would ride in on their white horse and save the day. And that's really what I get a chance to do every day in trauma surgery. Because I get a chance to help people, and you know, a lot of times we say people, sometimes we don't. And when we don't, it's really hard. It's difficult. Uh, and um, I basically make sure that when I lose a patient, I go and talk to their family because I think it's important uh, for you to be there and to feel the pain that people have because it keeps it real. Right? You can't go through this unless every time I lose somebody, it hurts. I feel like I lose something inside of me when I lose a patient because I look at my patients as if they're my family. When I think about people, I think about how would I like my family member to be cared for if they were injured or they had this problem. Today, I was doing elective general surgery clinic, and I saw 15 to 20 people. I still do elective general surgery. I do ICU care and care of critically ill people. I take care of trauma patients when I'm on call and acute care surgery patients. So I get a chance really to practice the full spectrum of trauma, acute care surgery, and general surgery. Too, um, I've been fortunate for many years to be able to do that. So many elements of your response just resonate with me. You talk about joining patients in their fellowship of suffering to center, again, their pain and their experience. You talk about the humanity of treating patients as if they were yourself or your own family, which I think sometimes maybe we as a self-defense mechanism distance ourselves from that reality, especially when I think you mentioned some of our non-successes when uh, we consider failure or our inability to help or cure disease or complications arise. So much of what you see in trauma, I imagine, changes who you are, your identity. There must be an element of trauma to the provider. Sometimes they talk about the second victim. What do you do to maintain a sense of wellness and a positive mindset when you see some of the things and experience some of the things that you see day to day? That's a great question. I have to say that it is difficult sometimes uh, when I have hard things that happen to me, and that does happen on occasion. And I have seen terrible things, and I've done things uh, to save people's lives, and I wasn't able to save them, and I think that's hard. And I think you have to realize that when I take care of patients now, because I have so much experience, when people come in, I can pretty much predict whether or not I'm going to save them or not, which is as part of the, I guess, being an OG factor, right? When you have experience with stuff. And I know there's some people I could save and some people I can't. The hardest part is the people I can't save, which is difficult because even when I want to save them, I won't be able to. Even with all the skills that I have, with all the outstanding people who work around me, that I'm not able to do that. And that's hard. 
So I think what I do is I basically step back for a bit and I basically think about it and I think about, okay, well, could I have done anything better? Did it, what can I learn from this? I try to learn something every day when I come to work and that keeps it fresh, that keeps it young and kind of rejuvenates us. And when something bad happens, you know, I talk to friends of mine who've had similar things so that we can process it because you have to process it. And the truth be told is as a trauma surgeon or as a surgeon period, we have a certain amount of PTSD or post-traumatic stress uh, when we do things. I mean, there are people that I lost when I was a junior surgeon that I would not lose today because I know what to do to save them. And there are some people that I can't save even if I had the skills I had today to do that. Understanding that you may not have created the injury that they had and that you're just trying to do as best as you can to have them survive. And I think when you, if you keep it like that, uh, then you understand it. But there are certainly times where I've been, I've had losses that have been profound and that um, I still remember uh, what happens and I try to learn uh, from these experiences that I had over the years because I've had now so many of them. Yeah, I, I completely echo those sentiments in your words. I take to heart and I will try to remember those when I have my own failures. I think there's so much gratifying work that comes being a interventionalist or a proceduralist or a surgeon who can see success in the moment. I think I, I share with you that desire to sort of be the one who can save the day. And during those incredible embolization cases where you see the bleed and you stop it with, as you know, as our colleague, Dr. Mark Wilson likes to say, beyond hashtag surgical precision. It's just really one of those moments that it makes being on call, it makes being tired worth it. But with, you know, those failures, I think comes imposter syndrome, a desire to maybe take a step back or it contributes to burnout. So I think being able to honor your complications and the patients by as you said, being better every day and learning from the mistakes you made in those situations, I think helps make you a better physician. So I thank you for, for sharing that perspective. So much of what you see in trauma is related to gun violence. And you've taken a center role as an advocate and leader in legislation and gun control. What perspective have you seen on the trauma side of things when it comes to gun violence? The first thing is that we have to look at gun violence in 2022 as a public health emergency. And by that, I mean that we have to say that there are too many people who are dying from it. It's interesting as you look over the years, the incidence of gun violence has, it has had ebbs and flows. In fact, during the pandemic, the incident of gun violence actually went down significantly. But after the pandemic, things have got a rebound and has gotten a lot worse than it was before. And that has, it's, it's multifactorial. It's related to the accessibility of guns, the amount of guns that are in the street. We have 400 million guns in the United States, we think, and we have 300 million people. So you just do the math and you say that, mo that a lot of people have more than one guns. And I think that we have to understand that that's leading to some of the problems that we had. Now, I've been fortunate to be an outspoken advocate over the years, including when we've had mass shootings here. I've been able to speak to the media and I've done some things on national media and other, other places that basically lets people understand how serious this is. The worst part about this, and I think I probably got into a little trouble after the YouTube shooting, I basically said that when the rich people get shot, like it was at YouTube when we had a mass shooting then, there was 30 cameras here. But when poor people get shot, which happens every day, which is what you and I see every day, I don't really see you guys here. And that kind of created a firestorm uh, in the media related to that. And I went viral by saying that. But it is true that it's every day and it happens all the time. I was fortunate that about three weeks ago, I was invited by the President of the United States to be at an event which celebrated the signing of the bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which is the first gun safety law that was signed into law in 30 years. Yeah, it doesn't go far enough. And yeah, we want to have an assault weapon ban like we had that worked from 1994 to 2004. It's true that when we had the assault weapon ban, the incidence of mass shootings went down significantly. This year, we've had probably about 350 or more mass shootings around the United States, which is on a trajectory to be more than what it was before, which is something that we need to be very present and mindful of. But the thing that you see in the, in the news media about the mass shootings, that happens a lot, but really the other shootings happen much more. So something north of about 40,000 people are injured in gun violence related accidents. And historically, it would be about two thirds 
from suicides or maybe a little bit more than half from suicides and the rest from homicides or, or what they call accidental shootings, which I don't, in my mind, nothing is really accidental. But the problem is, is that there's too many guns. There's too many people that, I mean, you know, the, the NRA, which is, you know, there's been a lot of things that have been said about the NRA. It's interesting, a couple of years ago, I was part of this movement, staying in our lane. And what happened was the NRA basically came out and told a physician, you physicians should stay in your lane. Don't talk about gun violence. So we came up with a thing and I was sort of part of it. But there's other folks who have original credit in that. Staying in our lane, this is our lane because we take care of the people who are injured so that we basically have much more, we are much more mindful of what's going on. So this is our lane is to talk about this. Our lane is to make sure that people understand the importance of gun safety and that, yeah, there was something that just happened that hadn't happened in 30 years, but we need to push forward. When I was at the White House, the president was talking about the assault weapon ban again, which is something that you know, we, we need to push for. So I look at the signing of the bill as something that is important, something that will make a difference. But it's just to start on this road of understanding right, that we must continue to make changes. Guns are part of our culture. I've been invited all over the country now. And it's interesting because uh, at first, I, being from New York and living in California now, it's very different in the middle of the country and other parts of the country. And we have to understand that people have grown up with guns and guns are part of their life. I remember after the one October shooting, which was a shooting, the biggest shooting in the whole country ever, 500 people were shot and 60 people were murdered um, after the one October shooting a few years ago. And what I found, I was sitting at a meeting with a guy who was a trauma surgeon. And I said, well, can you believe that that guy had 43 guns? And the trauma surgeon I was sitting next to, he says, I have 43 guns. And I was a little bit blown away from that, but he's a friend of mine. So I talked to him for maybe about 20 minutes about like, what does that mean? And I just, what I learned and what I learned from my friends around the country is that people have grown up with guns. It's sort of part of how they grew up. And, and we're going to have to understand that we have to talk to people and understand where they're coming from. If we're going to have guns, which we're going to have here, we can't be like Australia. Australia is a fascinating country. So is New Zealand, you know, lovely place. And I've been there a number of times lecturing and talking about gun violence. So I, I, one year um, I went to a, a conference and I've been there a bunch of times lecturing in Australia. And, they, and I was on a, on a panel and they said, in all of Australasia, that's, that means Australasia means Australia and New Zealand, they have about 23 million people. And in one year they had 16 shootings in the whole of Australasia. 16. And what had happened in Australia in 1997, there was a big shooting where about 50 or 60 people were killed. And what they did is they voted to basically take all the guns off the street. And it turned Australia into one of the safest countries in the world. You can walk around there anytime. You know, it's not that dangerous. It's pretty safe. But we can't have that solution here because of all the Second Amendment people who say that they have the right to bear arms. But that is still, to me, that's not a right interpretation of the Second Amendment with that. So with that, I just figured I would just say a few words about the one area that I'm very passionate about and happy to answer more questions about the gun safety or uh, issues that, that I've been involved with. Uh, I really appreciate your response. It, to me, shines on the complexity of gun identity as part of American culture. I think for many, as you said, it represents freedom, safety, protection, power, masculinity, and as you said, for some, a God-given constitutional right. For others, it is a symbol and tool of oppression, terror, control, and murder. And again, congratulations on the White House visit. You know, when you shared pictures with the Equity Council during your talk, it was truly incredible. And we're so proud and humbled that you represent us in our hospital to the leaders across the world and in our country. And as a leader who often has a seat at the table or who is within earshot of policy and legislation, am I allowed to ask where are you seeing progress being made on the front lines as it pertains to gun control in our country? Well, first of all, thank you for um, the, the compliment. I appreciate it. The progress is being made before this federal law. There was actually, there's probably about 15 or 20 different states that actually began to pass stricter gun safety laws. And so what was happening on the local level and the state level uh, was actually making some progress, which I thought was good. This new law has a lot of things in it. There was some enhanced background checks, so I don't think enough. Uh, it also has um, the funding for hospital-based violence intervention program, money for psychiatric intervention, 
money for research uh, in this area because you have to remember the Dickey Amendment, which was part of the Balanced Budget Amendment in 1998, basically said the federal government or CDC shall not spend any money on violence uh, or gun violence research. And to learn about things in order to figure out why we're in this predicament, you need to do research in it and figure out, well, well it's, it, there's so many fascinating things. So when I was in training in the middle 90s in New York, we had about 2,000 murders in New York City. And there's actually no place that is, comes even near that right now, even though Chicago has probably six or 700. They'll have about six, 700 murders this year, which is terrible. And one murder is too many. But for whatever reason, New York, Chicago, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, the numbers of, of homicides went down significantly in the, in the early 2000s, 2010s, uh, and more recently. So New York is one of the safest, bigger cities, and we still don't understand why that, that is. At the same time, Philly, Philadelphia, is more dangerous, and there's been 1,000 shootings there this year, and maybe 500 people have been murdered or something like that. Chicago is a problem. Atlanta has been problematic. But L.A., New York is still is, is is still experiencing less, even though it's more than it was uh, even a couple of years ago, because we went from having something like 2,000 murders a year and maybe 12,000 people shot or 14,000 people shot down to about four, three or 400 people being murdered in New York City, which is pretty amazing given that it's a city with 8 million people in it. San Francisco, in the worst times, we had about 150 murders a year, and that was in the mid-90s. Now, where the number of murders we have in San Francisco is closer to 30 or 40 a year, so there are less than there had been before. Even though the number of shootings have gone up, uh, we still are less than we have been at the time it was uh, the absolute worst that it possibly could be. So the answer to your question is, there's a lot of things going on at the local level. Here in California, we have some pretty strict laws, but the problem is, for example, you know, Illinois has very strict laws, but why is it that Chicago has so many murders? And that's because guns come in from Indiana, it comes in from surrounding uh, states that have lax gun laws. And because of that, that leads to all the problems that you have in Chicago. So that's why it's important to have a countrywide law that has that. And you, you probably know this, and it's destined to for failure in the Senate, is the House just passed a couple of days ago an assault weapon ban, and it's gone to the Senate now. But that's where bills go to die in. So that's kind of what's going on, just to give you an idea of some of the things that's going on. So small progress. This bill, the Safer Communities Act, does uh, have some interesting provisions that will make things safer, but we need to do more than we're doing right now. Yeah, I really appreciate your perspective and insight. I can't underscore the importance of voting and making your voice heard uh, locally at the state level and federally. It can come down to one vote in some of these critical instances. Uh, earlier, you talked about a misconception within the general public, probably put on by a lot of the Hollywood TV shows and movies about medicine and how it operates, especially like Grey's Anatomy, that people don't recognize you as a trauma surgeon, but as an ER physician. Uh, but as a radiologist, I can, you know, at least contest to the fact that many people don't even know that we're real physicians or that we are doctors. And interventional radiology hasn't been in the forefront of many discussions. Back in uh, June of 2017, unfortunately, there was a, a shooting in Alexandria, Virginia, where I think one of the Senate members was involved, and IR interventional radiology got a little bit of 15 minutes of fame, if you will, in the narrative. What, how have you seen the relationship between surgery and IR evolve throughout your career? First of all, I have to express my appreciation every day for the role that my friends in interventional radiology have played as we team up and figure out what's the best way to take care of patients. And I think that that's been a true uh, revolution in the last certainly 15, 20 years why R has become uh, really partners with us in trauma surgery to take care of patients uh, as we do that. And we, you know, you know, I come down and always talk to you when I'm have patients who I'm worried about. We have long discussions about what to do, what's the best way to take care of patients. And I think understanding the partnership that we have, the fact that we kind of see things very similarly, and we have almost, I mean, I think radi interventional radiologist has a surgical mindset in many ways about how to deal with problems. I mean, when I think about stopping bleeding, like when somebody comes in bleeding, I think about, is it a surgical problem where I need to operate on? Is it a problem where my friends in interventional radiology can help me? And what we try to do is we try to figure out, well, what is it a combined approach? Uh, is it is an approach where I go first and then you go to deal with things and 
you know, there, there's a there's a backstory to the the congressperson uh, who was who was shot at that baseball game, which I could share with you if we have time later on. But it, it really points to some of the problems we have in our society. As one of my friends actually operated on one of the Congress people who was shot at that baseball game and ended up having complications. Uh, and it was interesting uh, listening to hear what happened to him. I mean, he saved this is um, Representative Steve Scalise, and this is information that is out in the public. He saved his life, did a great job. But because um, the right wing media was so angry about what happened, they put out a story saying that he basically, he and the team that was there at the Western Hospital Center was trying to kill the congressperson. And because of that, he had to have FBI protection for about eight months uh, for that. And his family, their lives were being threatened uh, by that. So I think that, yeah, uh, the intervention radiologist got a minute of frame, but it sort of shows you that some of the problems that even though good things happen, things could become quite, quite complicated uh, afterwards. And uh, listening to him, and uh, he's been a friend of mine for a long time, I was... I was astounded at some of the things that happened after that episode because it was really the teamwork that saved the life of, of, the, of the congressperson, the surgeon, the, the interventional radiologist. Everybody did a wonderful job, and he's back to work, and he's actually normal now, which is pretty amazing. But uh, it was just uh, sad that that happened uh, the way it did, even though great things happened and, and their lives were saved. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I think it speaks to some of the internal conflicts that healthcare providers face, especially during the pandemic and the absolutely heartbreaking recent Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade and how it leaves a lot of family planning and abortion providers struggling to see how they fit into a society that at a state level rejects the services that they're trying to provide to their community. And I, and I really appreciate you talking about teamwork and collaboration for the benefit of patient care. There's such a, a narrative about turf battles and, you know, stealing cases from each other. But I think it really speaks to how medicine should move forward in a multidisciplinary approach where, as you said, you handle your end, we handle ours and working with anesthesia and other healthcare providers to keep patients alive in these critical moments, you can really do some magical game-changing uh, things in medicine that I think William Osler and the like would only dream of. Yeah, I think it really is a team. I, that, that is such, that can't be overemphasized. It is something that we work together and, and I always think about, well, what is the best thing for the patient at this time? You know, there's a question I've been trying to answer today about one of our patients and I'm thinking about, well, what's the best thing, right? How do you proceed? What is it better to do something or not do something, but uh, making sure that you get input from all the people who can help the patient is really essential to making sure the patient gets the best care possible. And we would be remiss not to discuss what we can offer to our community as a level one trauma center is not equally available to all members of the U.S. population. And the presence of trauma deserts or hospitals that lack basic level one, level two trauma settings has actually been shown to increase or improve mortality if you have a trauma center or decrease mortality if you don't by up to 25%. How do you, as an expert and leader in this field, see us improving as a society to get that access to where it needs to be for our rural residents in particular? The first thing is that we do not have a national trauma system. In California, we don't really have a total statewide trauma system, although there's been a lot of progress that is made in the big cities, and but there's a lot of places in between that don't have a trauma center or trauma system. If you drive from, the, let's say, New York to California, either L.A. or San Francisco, what you'll find is there are 1,300 counties that do not have a general surgeon uh, working, and usually the general surgeon is the one who cares for the trauma victims when they have, if they come to, for care at a level three, four, even a level five trauma center, uh, the, the fours and fives being more rural uh, trauma centers. So uh, we don't have adequate national trauma care across the board, and we need to make continue to make inroads. And we keep discussing this. I mean, a country like Germany, Germany is actually a lot smaller than ours. Germany has a national trauma system, right, uh, that works. Uh, we do not have it. And because of that, we do suffer. You know, I've done trauma surveys in a, at different rural states. Like I've been up to North Dakota a couple of times and Montana. And in those places, what they do is they actually have these things called critical access hospitals. 
And these critical access hospitals, what they do is they then send people to the, the level three or the level two trauma center, and then if necessary, they go somewhere else. But that's how our network of hospitals are put together right now. But if we actually had a real nationwide trauma system, then we things would be a lot easier. Now, there's been a lot more trauma centers come up more recently because of the designation criterion. And uh, I do uh, site surveys for the American College of Surgeons, so I see different trauma centers in different parts of the country. Been able to go all over the country to see things from Florida to New York to North Carolina to Arizona to Texas, all over California and up to North Dakota and and uh, Montana. So I've been all over the country uh, surveying hospitals and looking how trauma care is provided. There are some really out, truly outstanding places where trauma care is provided, and I think that that is really truly outstanding that they have a trauma care that is provided the way it is. Well, again, I appreciate your perspective and insight. You you have been recognized, and your commitment to medical education is nothing short of inspiring. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Haile DeBoss, who is a, a legend and hero here at UCSF. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you were one of the founding members of the Haile DeBoss Academy of Medical Educators. Uh, you've been an endowed chair of surgical education here at UCSF twice, uh, involved with third-year medical student clerkships, uh, directed the Surgical Critical Care Fellowship at UCSF for close to two decades your role in inspiring, mentoring, and sponsoring medical students and residents and fellows is almost uncountable. You've given so much valuable advice and insight. Is there any other words of wisdom or insight you'd like to share to those who are entering medicine or trying to figure out how they fit in in the medical specialty? Well, thanks for those kind words. Uh, I appreciate it. So, so, uh, so what I always try to do, and I, I'm fortunate that I'd be able to counsel uh, medical students, residents, and fellows. I always say that I, I teach medical students how to be physicians. I teach residents how to be surgeons. And I train fellows how to be doctors of disaster. And each, each as people move up the food chain, they need to have help doing different things so that the students need help in deciding uh, where to apply how to be successful in a match, how to do all the things that they do to be successful. And they need it, right? And but I try to provide them. And I've been fortunate to support many students over the years, many who are now attendings in their own right in surgery around the country. Uh, some of the folks that I supported who were uh, residents and fellows who are now full professors of surgery around the country uh, have worked, obviously, with people on into radiology who have been successful in their radiology careers. So it's really been absolutely fantastic to have the chance to influence people in a positive way uh, through the work that I've done in terms of counseling. I've also worked a lot with students who struggled to the match, and I work with the dean's office and people who have not been able to match, and I try to get them on their way if that happens, and that's been doing that for about 15 years. But the main thing is for me is to try to get people through the match, help write their letters. Uh, some years I write 10 letters of recommendation, some I do 19. I've done a lot of letters of recommendation. I support faculty around the country uh, for their promotion, so I've been fortunate to be able to do that. I'm getting ready next year to be president of the Society of Black Academic Surgeons, which is an organization which provides important mentorship, and not only to African Americans, but women and other, other folks around the country who are interested in surgery. And it's really been an actually outstanding organization to be part of uh, over the last you know, uh, 20 years or so. Uh, so there is something that's important to be said that, that everyone who is coming along needs to have help. The students who are applying to residency, training program, they're all just totally petrified about this whole match process. When I talked to them, I talked to them about the fact I went to the match twice and what that was like, you know, for me, uh, that uh, it was a challenge and it was something that was hard, but I was able to be successful uh, in doing that. And I was pretty happy that, that I, I did that. And that's really great. So that, I think that that helps them. And if there are certainly a tweener between specialties, they'll come and talk to me. In terms of surgical residents, we're thinking about trauma surgery as a career. We kind of talk about what that's like and the joys of being a trauma surgeon and also the challenges of what it's like to do that. And then uh, the faculty, I try to help our junior faculty be successful here and talk to faculty around the country and mentoring them uh, to be supportive. But, you know, people ask me things in all other specialties too. And I try to be as helpful as I can when I do that. Thank you for that response, Dr. Campbell. You talk about mentorship, sponsorship, speaking truth to power, so many elements we didn't have a chance to go into, including the ways in which your experience 
had with oppression within society when you talked about white flight and the crack epidemic and how redlining and districting of neighborhoods forced the cooperative developments. You have been just such a role model for so many in the field. I just want to express gratitude for everything you do, especially in terms of inspiring and supporting uh, minority voices and identities in medicine. Over your three decades, I know we probably should dedicate even more time to this conversation, but are you seeing signs that we should be optimistic about in terms of increasing minority representation within medicine and surgical specialties? Well, that's a really, that's a complex question, and I guess there are many answers. I'll just start off by saying a couple of things. In, in surgery, surgery has been, over the years, very male-dominated, but because of things that have happened at this institution, and I have to cite the work that, that Nancy Asher did, who is our former chair of surgery and our current chair, Dr. Sosa, uh, in between Dr. Roberts, that, and before that, Dr. Bass and Dr. Schrock, we slowly but surely have been increasing the numbers of women uh, residents, and we're probably in the mid-40% in terms of number of women residents uh, who have come here uh, to train over the years. There's a lot of women faculty who are extremely successful in leadership positions, and I think that's very encouraging and exciting. We're still working on uh, the issues related to people underrepresented in medicine and what to do and how to make sure that uh, folks are successful. I think over the last couple of years, what we've been able to do is we've been able to increase the numbers of underrepresented medicine residents. And we went from, from having um, a small number to having a larger number now. Two years ago, uh, the intern class had four uh, Latinos out of eight categorical residents. This year, we have three African-American women in the intern class with one Latino and seven women out of eight people total, one guy. So we've actually had really some success. The year before that, we had uh, two Latinos in the third year class. We actually have more African-American women in our residency than we had in the whole history of the program. There's only been five women to ever finish our program, 15 total African-Americans to finish the program over the last 70 years. So we still have a lot of work to do. The School of Medicine has actually been working towards that in terms of providing opportunities. They got some donors to donate some money so that financial obstacles to coming to a great place like UCSF has not been as much an issue so that we've been able to improve the number of underrepresented medicine uh, in the class. Obviously, we've done a wonderful job with women, increasing number of women in our medical school class too. So there, there's some things to be proud of and excited about, but there's this concept that, well, there's not any qualified people to do that. You know, what's interesting, about seven years ago, almost now eight years ago, the Department of OBGYN did something that I think really sort of revolutionized the way that we did recruitment here. They have about nine uh, residents a year, and there was actually one whole year that all they had was people who underrepresented medicine. That means either somebody was black or brown in their class, which is something that I think points to the fact that if you look, right, if you provide a supportive environment, right, then people will come. And that really changed the way that people started looking at things here, that like you can do it and we can, we can improve the numbers by making sure that people understand that there's opportunities here for them to be sexual and thrive. The whole issue of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion is, okay, you want to make sure that you invite people in, but you got to make sure that they're comfortable when they get here and they're successful. And that's really the next phase. You can get people to come, but you got to make sure that they feel comfortable, they feel welcome, you know, people really support them. So inviting them to the party, but the inclusion is really allowing them to to dance at the party and be an active member of the society in, in the department that they're in. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I I want to echo the attention that you bring to intentionality and recruitment, uh, the importance of holistic review. I want to also applaud Dr. Biftu Mangesha as one of the faculty within ob as you spoke to, to look to really revamp recruitment uh, with an intentionality perspective. I also want to echo and reiterate for those of you deciding on which program to go to, UCSF stands for You Can Stay Forever, uh, and it's nothing short of inspiring to see all the different identities represented in medicine as trainees and faculty and attendings. And I am on call this weekend, so for all of your partners, uh, I am ready and willing to assist because it is nothing short of humbling and an honor to help work alongside you to deliver care for the patients of our community. Dr. Campbell, it's been Absolutely a pleasure to speak to you. I know we probably went way over time, and I'm sorry for taking up time in your schedule, but thank you again from the bottom of my heart for joining in in this honest conversation. 
Well, I just want to thank you, Vassell. I mean, uh, my partners will be so happy to know that you're on call and that, that you're here to help, which we really enjoy uh, the partnership that we have. And I just want to thank uh, your audience for listening today. And I, and, uh, I always really uh, find it's an honor and a privilege to engage in these discussions and uh, talk about these important issues. And I really appreciate you giving me a chance to chat with you today about all these very weighty and important issues uh, here. Thank you so much, and I appreciate it. It's been an honor to spend time with you today. Thank you. Oh, thank you again. Special thanks to Aaron and the Back Table podcast team for offering this space as a means to center the conversation. Thank you again, Dr. Campbell, and thank you, listeners. Uh, we know your time is valuable, and we appreciate you being with us. Be well. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.